It's been a year since our beloved mother Mary Angelica passed away. Tonight, we remember this iconic spiritual leader with those who knew her best. Mother Angelica is our focus on this very special edition of The World Over Live. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. It's been nearly a year since Reverend Mother Mary Angelica left us on Easter Sunday, 2016. As we approach this anniversary of her passing, I wanted to bring you an encore of our tribute to Mother, the foundress of EWTN and the first woman in the history of broadcast television to lead a cable network as CEO and show host ever. Over the next hour, we'll revisit some of the turning points of Mother's extraordinary life and reminisce with those who knew her best, close friends, family, colleagues, her sisters, and co-workers. Mother was born Rita Antoinette Rizzo in Canton, Ohio on April 20th, 1923. She was abandoned by her father at five and left in the care of May Rizzo, her manically depressed mother. Rita and her mother struggled in a ghetto populated by working class Italians and African Americans. She was plagued by disability from the beginning. A stomach ailment proved a turning point. Rita was having difficulty eating and was diagnosed with ptosis of the stomach. The opening of the stomach was constricted. She was losing weight and was very ill. Her mother took her to visit a mystic, a woman named Rhoda Wise who claimed to see Jesus and St. Therese. When she met with Rita, Wise merely gave the girl a prayer card, a nine-day novena, which Rita and her mother prayed. Nine days later, Rita Rizzo was free of pain and could eat again. She fell madly in love with Jesus, and at that point, knew for the first time that she had a father in heaven, if not on earth, who cared for her well-being and loved her individually. We're joined from D.C. by Barbara Houghton. She is Mother Angelica's cousin and one of her few relatives. Barbara, tell me what Mother got from your Aunt May, her mother May. She was a great storyteller, wasn't she, May? Yes, and we called her Aunt Mamie, mm -hmm. and she was a great storyteller. Um, she used to babysit us and tell us stories about how heaven was paved with gold and the streets were gold, the buildings were gold, and the people were gold and everything <laughs> was gold, so that when you got up there, it was of great reward. She used to also tell us stories that scared us and then put us to bed. <laughs> she was quite a character, <laughs> my Aunt May. Do you, do, you see, do you see any of her in Mother Angelica when you watch the shows? Oh, yes. I mean, the storytelling, the vivacity, mm -hmm. the, the facial resemblance, um, yes, and it makes us miss her all the more. When we used to watch Mother Angelica and, you know, Aunt, Aunt Sister David, my Aunt Mamie, mm -hmm. was gone, and, and, and she, was just, she was just a wonderful aunt to grow up with. Mm -hmm. And she made, made the best homemade pasta of anybody, <laughs> of, of any place I've ever had it, my well, Aunt Mame. The well, best homemade pasta. That's one of the reasons why Mother Angelica brought her mother May here to Birmingham, and her mother joined <laughs> the religious order. I think part of it was just to keep good food on the table. You know, Mother couldn't stand eating the stuff that was yes. being cooked by the others. Uh, what no. was the family lore about Rita entering the convent? I know the healing changed her life, but May Rizzo was not terribly excited about this at the time. No. Well, I wasn't around then, but the family lore is that, you know, Rita just set off. She just took off and mm -hmm. joined the convent. I know we're, we're, we're summarizing here, and yeah. my Aunt May it was her only child. She was a woman who was divorced, and, and Rita was her only child, and so she sent my Uncle Nick up there to Cleveland, I guess it was, to try to convince her to not join, to come home, come to her senses and come home. And she didn't. She was very headstrong, and she made the right decision. Hmm. Uh, what, what aren't we hearing about Mother Angelica that you want people to know about? Well, you know, when we were kids, we used to go visit her in the monastery, and my Aunt Mame didn't drive, so we'd pick her up and take her to visit uh, Mother 
in the monastery, and it was a cloistered monastery. We were little kids, and and you know we used to visit her, and we'd have to put our fingers through uh, through the grate to touch her. And you know, we, when we were really little, we'd say, well, "Why is she in jail?" You know, and um, <laughs> she just was always. Well, you know, you were a little kid going to visit a cloistered nun. You mm -hmm. wonder what she do bad that she can't come out. Right. But she was just. She'd lift her veil and make us laugh because we knew she wasn't supposed to do that. And she was always so happy to see her family. We were always so happy to see her. Mm. And we just, you could just tell, she was my early role model. I mean, I had, I had my girlfriends that lived on the block. They all had dolls. I had regular dolls, but I'm the only one on the block that had a nun doll. <laughs> because she, she was my role model, model as a woman. I still have that nun doll. Wow. She was my role model as a woman. You could just... You could just tell there was just a light shining over her, yeah. and everybody in the family knew it. Well, you picked a great role model. So, Barbara, thank you for being here and for sharing your memories. Thank you, Raymond, for having me. Okay. Following her healing, Rita Rizzo, to back this story up a little bit, she fell head over heels in love with God and was determined to bond with Him in some way. This is a neighborhood friend, Stephen Zaleski. And he recalls a certain Good Friday when Rita Rizzo approached the crucifix. Watch this. But I noticed when she went up the last to kiss it, she kissed it like a, a, a wife kisses her husband or like a lover. The definite difference, I could see right there she had an intense love for the Lord. And in another case, she was working at Timpkins at that time, and she had a picture that Rhoda Wise painted on her desk about the Lord, a beautiful picture. And they were complaining, said, you're parading your religion, her friends there. And she said, what? She said, it's all right for you to put your, your uh, sweetheart's picture or a picture of some movie star, somebody you love. So I'm putting a picture, the one I love, that picture stays there. Before she became a nun, she was in church, and there's a sorrowful mother statue there. And... Uh, she looked at the statue, and, and our Lord spoke to her, spoke to her through the statue, said, why are you keeping me waiting? Why are you keeping me waiting? Then she knew that the Lord wanted her to come to here to follow him as soon as possible. So she did everything in secret. She didn't tell, dare tell her mother, her mother, oh, she'd really raise the roof. In 1944, Rita secretly entered a poor Claire convent in Cleveland, imagining she would never see the world again. Then pain intruded. In 1953, Joan Frank was working with Sister Angelica on the second floor of their monastery when this happened. We were scrubbing a hallway in preparation maybe for a feast day or something. And instead of just putting the scrubber, um, she sprinkled the floor with soapy water ahead of it. And when the scrubber came on to the soapy water, it kicked back and hit her and knocked her over, uh, really severely injuring her bad. And she was never the same after that. Walking grew more difficult, and Sister Angelica underwent numerous surgeries, including a major one in 1956. The night before the surgery, Dr. Hout came and said, Sister when you wake up from surgery tomorrow, you might not feel your legs. In fact, you might never walk again. And she says, oh, that shrouded her in darkness, the thought of never walking again. And she said, I promised God that if I was able to walk, I would start a monastery of adoration. That was a promise. That promise contained something I discovered years later. Mother didn't just promise to build a monastery, but a monastery to pray for racial healing. She grew up witnessing the injustice endured by African Americans in her neighborhood and spiritually sought to fight it. She did walk again with the assistance of crutches and a pair of braces, leading her to comment years later, when you make a deal with God, be very specific. She wrote letters to several bishops asking for permission to build a poor Clare monastery in their diocese. Only one bishop responded the Bishop of Mobile, Birmingham. Angelica had found her new home. Now she had to get there. When our World Over tribute to the life of Mother Angelica continues, God uses a dodo 
and a network is born. Stay with us. I think she'll be remembered, I would think, Raymond, uh, I hope not as a can-do American entrepreneur who okay. defied all the predictions and okay. uh, was kind of an in-your-face, <laughs> but as someone who uh, precisely embodied that um, brilliant, penetrating insight of uh, Dickerson, you know, the sacramentality of the present, present moment. moment. Yeah. It's here. Don't lose the here now, or you might lose it forever. Okay. Uh, she had a gift for simplification without being anti-intellectual. Yeah. She had a gift for uh, spontaneity yeah. within the context of a profound immersion in authoritative tradition. And all of these combined make her and her witness for our time, and please God, for ages to come, a, a great gift to the church and to the world. Cloistered nuns in television is without question one of the most ridiculous things that could have ever happened. It just evolved. When I went to Channel uh, 38 in Chicago, I walked in that little tiny, tiny studio. I had never seen a studio, a TV studio before. We had already been uh, publicizing books for a couple of years, reaching a lot of people. But I remember standing in the doorway and saying, it doesn't take much to reach the masses. And I said, Lord, I've got to have one of these. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to our World Over tribute to the life and legacy of Mother Angelica. In 1959, Sister Angelica had been invited by the Bishop of Birmingham to establish a monastery in the Deep South. But how to pay for it? Here we see the first glimmer of Angelica the Entrepreneur. She started a mail order business, a fish lure business to be exact, run by she and a few nuns. That enterprise paid for the construction of the monastery. Once they got to Birmingham, the nuns sustained themselves by roasting peanuts. The little old peanut company distributed their nuts to stores and arenas all over Alabama. At the same time, Mother was offering a Bible study to a group of Episcopalian women that expanded to include many others. This led to an audio tape ministry where her talks were recorded and disseminated, played on the radio, and soon she was invited to speak all over the country. Those talks were electric. I want to take Abraham. Do you have any idea when you read that beautiful scripture do you ever put guts into it and blood? Or is it just a little story you read? So isn't it wonderful? Abraham had faith. Three cheers. <laughs> Do you really know what he did? Do you know what happened to him? Here's a man 90 years old. 90. Anybody here 90 years old? See, nobody 90 would even come tonight. <laughs> And here's Abraham sitting near his tent, probably doting. <laughs> the 
he hears a voice and it says, Abraham. <laughs> says, huh? <laughs> said, Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> Abraham, you shall be the father of a great nation. Sarah <laughs> listening. She goes, Yeah. <laughs> you know what she's thinking? She's thinking whoever that is doesn't know. have been something else. <laughs> Some women are so naggy. I bet she kept saying every three, four months, I told you, I told you, I told you. I told you. <laughs> Mother Angelica started to appear on Protestant television programs where she became something of a fixture. And the monastery is there now. Right. That mm -hmm. you designed. Design on paper. and on paper, and I brought it down. It took us three months to find land, and I got to tell you this: it took us three months to find land. And when we finally did, uh, the architect we bought this land. We went up north while he made the engineering plans and came down. He said, "Mother, you're going to have to sell that land." And I said, "Why?" He said, "Because it's like this." <laughs> he said, "You don't have money." Uh, to build the roof, let alone uh, blast that rock. And he said, it's solid rock. We took a core test. I said, no, that's where the Lord wants us. Mm -hmm. He said, you don't understand. You know, men look at women like they were yeah. dodos. You don't yeah. <laughs> you get that. And if you're a nun and a woman, it's worse. Oh. <laughs> her popularity led her to record a Bible series for the Christian Broadcasting Network. And her friend Jean Morris and Sister Raphael, her vicar, were the crew, marketing team, and primary supporters. By 1978, her television success and the emergence of cable inspired Mother to begin exploring the idea of building her own network, a Catholic cable enterprise. Matt Scalisi was there at the very beginning, and he joins me now. Matt, thanks for being here. Thanks for having now, me. Now, tell people, give them a sense of how fragile this enterprise was at the beginning. People think, oh, Mother, Mother had the whole plan. It was all laid out. Well, not at all. As you, you know, Mother's told the story better than I possibly could. I mean, you know that her inspirations happened bit by bit. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like God revealed this entire plan at once. Mm -hmm. She tells the story about being at the Chicago television station, tiny little studio, and mm -hmm. looking up and saying, well, it doesn't take much to reach the masses. Uh, Lord, I got to have one of these. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that was long before, really, right. the moment that you just described. Mother, um, Mother, I think it would be good to lead into it by saying Mother's sense of faith Mother's sense of direction and inspiration was something she shared with everyone, and that was that you live in the present moment, mm -hmm. meaning you're not looking forward, you're not looking backward, and sometimes that means you don't know where the next step is. Mm -hmm. And so Mother loved to say, faith is having one foot on the ground, one foot in the air, and that queasy feeling in your stomach. Yeah. She said it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason she said it a thousand times is because she lived it a thousand times. Mm. G give us a sense of what we're missing about her. In the sense of the mother in those early years, she was very intuitive. She was very in touch with you all. This was a small nucleus of people around her. It wasn't a hundred people. 
No, it was a handful. Uh, we people. started with four or five people. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, there was a, as you know, there was a garage under construction. Mm -hmm. I was just graduating college at the time. She asked if I would come help out. I thought I was doing a friend a favor. <laughs> I'd grown up and down the street from mother, and mm -hmm. she she was very special to me. And of course, I would say yes. And I came here with with really uh, Jenny Dominic and one or two other people to help out to see mm -hmm. if we couldn't help produce TV. Um, we were never certain how we would afford television equipment, uh, how we would move on from here, and if we made it, where it would ever find a viewership. So, huh. you know, the, things were things were fragile every day, and uh, you know, it'd be easy just to talk about the financially fragile. Mm -hmm. um, there was plenty of self doubt. There were plenty of times where you would step out in faith, and you'd begin to produce something that you thought had merit. And then you'd hit a roadblock. It happened over and over. It probably still happens today. You'd hit a roadblock and you'd go, well, Lord, she would say, Lord, will you let me here? Where do you want me to go now? Mm -hmm. And uh, you made a comment uh, just prior to air where you said sometimes mother found herself out on a limb and the only, only direction to go was forward. forward yeah. And so she would do so, not knowing mm -hmm. what was beyond you know, her vision. Uh, and I think that was the beauty of it, is that she completely trusted God. And she was perfectly willing to accept that if he had brought her to this point only to let it fail, that she'd been faithful mm -hmm. to the inspiration, that she had done the best she could, and if it failed, it failed. What is her legacy in your estimation? Well, there are tens of millions of people, some Catholic, some not Catholic but Christian, mm -hmm. some not Christian but um, yearning to understand and believe. I've met so many of them myself, just in, and I've I've been away from the network since 1993. Mm -hmm. Sometimes without even knowing uh, who I was or where I came from, stories would emerge about people whose lives were touched by this network. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was about mother. And sometimes it was about something completely different. So the mm -hmm. legacy is that th her ministry, this inspiration, lived on and will live on beyond Mother Angelica's involvement. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the true test, right? Yeah, Max Galisi, thank you for being here and, uh, and for all you did uh, in those early days. And you continue to stay close to Mother. She spoke fondly of you for many, many years. So thank Thanks you for coming. Thanks very much, Raymond. My now, pleasure. EWTN was founded as a spiritual growth network. That's what Mother said at the time. But the culture at large and currents in the church would make it into something much more. Our tribute to the life and legacy of Mother Angelica continues in a moment. Stay right there. Mother Superior Angelica. Mother Superior, uh, we have very little time available. I want to find out why it is that you think so differently, for example, from Jim Robinson. You don't want to collect money. You don't want to preach politics. Why not? I believe that the network was created by God to teach the person in the living room, the person in the pew, how to live in a nitty-gritty, gutsy world, how to live the gospel, how to be inspired by the Spirit. God bless all uh, EWTN uh, viewers, and thank you, Mother Angelica, for having a vision, uh, a spry little woman who said, it can be done when everybody said it couldn't be done, a, a, a tower of faith. <laughs> didn't give us six months. I heard him. 
<laughs> I was at a cable convention when the first one I ever went to, and I heard two people say, they'll never make it. And one man said, ah, six months. <laughs> ha, ha. <laughs> By the early 1980s, the post-Vatican II confusion was at full tilt. Traditions were up for grabs, devotions were being cast aside, talk of women's ordination and inclusive language was all the rage. Mother Angelica would have none of it. Despite her unorthodox approach to business, no budgets, no long-term plans, just a radical dependence on divine providence that God would provide, Angelica was quite orthodox when it came to her faith. By the early 1990s, she broadcast many endangered devotions, the rosary, chaplets, and the mass, all performed with an attention to reverence that was not lost on the growing viewership. We are joined by Father George Rutler, a longtime friend of Mother Angelica's and, of course, a staple here on EWTN. Father, thank you for joining us. What do you think is Mother's legacy vis-a-vis -vis the example, the vision that she put forth to the general public about how Catholicism should look and sound and feel? Well, how could we really talk about a, a legacy without just looking around us? You know, the, the famous architect, uh, Sir Christopher Wren, was mm. buried in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and in his in the Latin inscription basically says, if you want a monument, look around you. Mm. So if you want to see Mother's legacy, just look around you. I can attest that uh, amongst her great legacies uh, have been, number one, uh, converts to the faith, mm. Uh, number two, reverts, that's the new expression, people who have recovered their faith, mm -hmm. and um, consecrated vocations. I, yes. I, I, I'm astonished at how many young men, uh, young priests, tell me that they have f f found uh, their priestly calling uh, through, through EWTN, women and men in the consecrated religious life. Mm -hmm. So this is incalculably important yeah. in the life of the church. Mm. Uh, Father, what do you think she represented as a woman, perhaps the most influential woman in the church in the United States, at a time when the world was insisting that women had no power in the church and that perhaps ordination of women was the answer? Well, she proved that in the church, the only power that matters is grace. Mm. The, the action of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the period of right after the Council, Second Vatican Council, was a very neurotic time in many ways, and people were looking for different uh, identities. Uh, and they identified, they confused grace with uh, political uh, uh, power. Mm. Uh, she had the greatest power of all. Uh, she was a mother. There is no more important figure in the world than a mother. Every one of us has had a biological uh, a mother. She was a spiritual mother in the same sense that priests are spiritual fathers. And she reminded us of that. And I was thinking of that, too, when I was reading some of the announcement, announcements of her death. Mm. Uh, one one announcement said, we regret to inform you of the passing of Mother Angelica. Well, first of all, no regret. Mm -hmm. I mean, 92 years old, all she accomplished, she was faithful to our Lord. She suffered so much physically in so many ways. She's been relieved of that now. Pope Francis, I understand, when he heard about her death, said that he thought that she went right to heaven. Yeah. That's pretty important. <laughs> and. Uh, so there's no regret if, and also I objected to that term passing. How, you see how easily we get infected by the language of the world. Yeah. There are certain Gnostic sects like the Christian scientists who say that people passed away. <laughs> well, we can understand that. We, uh, a death of a it loved one is traumatic. Death, yeah. yeah, but we don't pass away. In the liturgy, we don't say Christ has passed. We say Christ has died. And Mother would have been the first one to say, yes, we really die, but we die in the hope of the resurrection. As St. Paul says, the first letter to the Thessalonians, we would not have you be as those uh, without hope. 
Thank you, Father George Rutler. Mother Angelica was at heart a traditionalist, and factions in the Catholic Church were moving in their own direction, often battling Pope John Paul II and taking issue with his teaching. In 1993, things came to a head for Mother Angelica. She excitedly partnered with the U.S. Bishops Conference to broadcast World Youth Day from Denver. But when a woman, a mime, assumed the role of Jesus in the Stations of the Cross, Mother had had enough. This moment would change her life and the life of her network forever. It's blasphemous that you dare try to portray Jesus as a woman. You know, as Catholics, we've been terribly quiet all these years. After Vatican Council, those beautiful documents inspired by the Holy Spirit, they're so beautiful when you read those documents, like reading scripture. But they were misrepresented and misportrayed and misinterpreted all these years, and every excuse, like this mime, had been blamed on the Vatican documents. I'm tired, I'm tired of being pushed in corners. I'm tired of your inclusive language that refuses to admit the Son of God is a man. I'm tired of your tricks. I'm tired of your deceit. I'm tired of you constantly just making a crack. And then the first thing you know, there's a hole and all of us fall into it. No, this was deliberate. You made a statement that was not accidental. And this is just as much a lie as the lies we got last night. I am so tired of you liberal church in America. You see this collar? We had this little modern collar so that we would really appeal to this modern world, this pagan society. Am I bitter? No. But I'm being realistic. We're going to change it. We're going to look very Roman. Because I'm making a statement. You've hidden your agenda with a mime. My agenda is not hidden, but I have yet to hear anyone contradict you or cross you or say anything to distress you. Well, I'm saying it. I'm saying it. I say it as an individual who has a right before God to be Catholic, and I resent. I resent your pushing your ways and your anti-Catholic, ungodly ways upon the masses of this country. Live your life. Live your falsehood. Live your lies. Leave us alone. Do what you want to do. You have that privilege from God himself. But don't pour your poison, your venom, on all the church. Coming out of World Youth Day, Mother Angelica would revert to the traditional habit of her youth and double down on her brand of vibrant orthodoxy. The activist spirit reemerged in Angelica. She would lobby against the film The Last Temptation of Christ, seeing it as blasphemous. She fought against inclusive language in the liturgy and agitated on behalf of the unborn. Joining us to discuss the fighting spirit of the activist Mother Angelica is Bill Donahue, the president of the Catholic League. Bill, thanks for being with us. Your thoughts on Mother Angelica, the activist, what did she represent to you? You were just starting around the same time. Well, exactly. That was in 1993 when I took over in the Catholic League. And at that time, I'm looking for some role models. I had two. I had Cardinal John O'Connor, the Archbishop uh, of New York, and I was up there in 1011, which is the headquarters of the Archdiocese. He was a great inspiration, a model uh, for me. But she was the other one. Uh, both of them stood for not only for life, but they were vigorous in the defense of the faith. In the case of Mother Angelica, 
Uh, I was also, a, I, I was so much appreciative of her great sense of humor mm. as well as her courage. I mean, she struggled physically, she struggled emotionally, but her perseverance, and she understood in this particular case, having the woman as the stand-in for Jesus. Now, there are even people today who say, well, what's so wrong with that? They ought to go back and dial it back to what she said in 1993. She said, well, if they chose a woman to represent Martin Luther King, how well would that sit with the African-American community, mm. all right? She understood what was going on here. People playing fast and loose with our theology. And she had the guts to stand up to an awful lot of people on that subject. Last Temptation of Christ as well. She knew that the pop culture does form people's minds, their sentiments, their ideas. And if they get away with that with impunity, we're only going to get more of it. Would you like your children to be depicted? But just a minute, Mother. I, you have a daughter? I take, I, you I have take, a daughter? Just a minute. I'll be tell you something. You have a daughter. We, my wife and I were very stern about what films and books our children ah. read. But I did not, I must tell uh -huh. you in all honesty, uh -huh. I did not allow anyone in the church or in the school to tell my wife and me how to raise our children. If you like your daughter depicted on the movie as a prostitute, if would she you was permit? An actress, uh, mm -hmm. an I didn't say crap. that. I mean her real person as your daughter. Would you well, like her sue. depicted as a prostitute? Well, I could probably sue. So I guess. I ah, then you would say it was wrong. Not, I would never want. I would never say you can't do that because I think uh, that's prior censorship. As a father, you would have to say, "I do. I will not have my daughter depicted as a prostitute because I know well, mother, my daughter and she's a good uh, woman." Uh, Don't we're tell take a break. me that. We're take... hmm. She was always tough, but she was never mean. Yeah. She was a great holy woman. She's the, she towers over all of our, us Catholics here today, and uh, I, I think her legacy is, is secure. How long-reaching do you think her influence, uh, or do you consider her influence, Bill, and that legacy? Oh, I think it's going to go on for decades. I mean, for one thing, I mean, uh, Archbishop uh, Fulton J. Sheen was the first one to use uh, any religion, any cleric, to, to use the, the television medium to get forth his message. But she went beyond that. She built a, a media empire, which is worldwide. To that extent, it's impossible for people going forward to talk about EWTN without talking about Mother Angelica. She's the origin. She's the root. And I hope that everybody who's watching will insist that uh, all the programming keep in mind that she's the one who set the parameters. She wasn't sufficiently... Uh, she wasn't just, you know, sufficient to say, listen, when we are being attacked by those in the media, the entertainment world, the artistic world, in government, that we should pray for those people who are working against us. That's a very Catholic thing to do. But that's not sufficient, okay? You need something else. You need to fight back. I've often used the example of our Jewish brothers and sisters who don't take it as much as we take it, which is precisely why they don't have as much thrown at them. Mm. You need that kind of fighting spirit which Mother Angelica had. And where are all these people on the left within the Catholic Church and also outside the Catholic Church? Why don't they hail her as a great woman? She stood up, up against a lot of bishops for that matter. She was a great role model for women that she was going to go out there. She wasn't a feminist in the sense of pro-choice, pro obviously. She was against abortion. But she was a role model for a woman. I don't care what ideological stripe you come from. She doesn't get enough credit for that. And it took Commonweal Magazine, a, a media outlet on the left, three days before they even recognized her achievements, which they ran, actually, a review of uh, your book a long time ago. Uh, yeah. that, that tells me a lot, too. She took on the left. She took on the right, if necessary. She took them all on, and she won. Yeah, well, Bill, uh, you had a kindred spirit there. I remember traveling with Mother in the late 1990s, and you were on CNN or something. It might have been in an airport. And she, she was watching you, and she said, this Donahue, is he married? We need bishops like this. So you had a fan <laughs> in Mother, Bill. Well, you know, she was my catalyst. She was my inspiration. And uh, uh, not only was she a holy woman, but, boy, she could take people to the mat, and rightfully so. And then when some people on our side didn't like her, they tried to discipline her. What a bunch of phonies. Mm. Bill Donahue, thanks for your insight. As always, we'll check in with you later. Despite Thank Mother's you. activism, throughout the 1990s, she still knew how to have a good time. Watch this. What do you think, guys, a yo-yo? <laughs> you know, it's got a, this century we do this, that century we don't. Hey, what's the matter with you? Huh? <laughs> 
Raymond's with me, and it's his birthday. Really? You know what? How old are you? I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> well, do you want me to tell you how old you look? Oh, oh. <laughs> you really want to know? Well, guess. Uh, if it's honest. Well, I'll tell you the truth if you can guess it. But how old could you be? Is it that I difficult? I could say you're 30, but no, you can't be 30. Why 40? not? 40? 40? <laughs> 40? What's wrong with 40? You got I was bit older than me. I what would... do you mean? <laughs> 40? Yeah. It was 40 once. Yeah, but I'm not even close to 40, though. Well, how would I know? You don't tell me, so I'm guessing. My goodness. All right, if you're not 40 okay. and you're not 30, you got to be between. 31. Oh, really? 31. That's all you are. Yeah. And I'm aging by the minute. <laughs> I'll never forget. I've said it so most of you haven't heard it. This woman calls me up and she says, oh. My husband's living with another woman. In my house. What? <laughs> well, kick him out. <laughs> How are you going to say that nice? <laughs> you could say, well, how unfortunate. Get over it. Why don't you just open the door and <laughs> tell him to leave? You can't say it nice. It's not a nice thing. So after I said that little, gave her that little advice, she said, oh, I can't. What do you mean you can't? They have no place to go. <laughs> Well, hell is where they're aiming for. <laughs> Tell them to go there. <laughs> Why don't you air these people? And I said, no, I won't, because I don't think they're Catholic. He says, by what right do you have to say that? I said, I own the network. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you won't always be there. And I said, I'll blow the damn thing up before you get your hands on it. So they caught you on a good day. <laughs> yeah, on a good day. I could watch those all night. A 1996 trip to Bogota, Colombia proved decisive for Mother. There she encountered a statue of the divine child Jesus, the Divino Nino. She believed the child Jesus called her to build a temple in his honor, and he would, quote, help those who help you. Mother the Builder had a new project. I just want that chapel to overwhelm everybody. Should they think it's the reality of God's presence, God's house? This is where he dwells. Come.
it's foolish to think that you're going to die and pop boom, right into heaven when you hate half the people there. <laughs> Welcome back to our World Over Tribute to the Life and Legacy of Mother Angelica. I'm Raymond Arroyo. In the mid-1990s, Mother Angelica single-handedly created Catholic radio in the United States. She made her shortwave radio programming available for free to anyone who would buy a station in the U.S. Many responded. And EWTN expanded to reach those in cars and homes and workplaces inaccessible via television. Today, there are more than 300 EWTN radio affiliates nationwide. In November of 1997, Mother continued to advocate for orthodoxy. For Angelica, the spouse she lived for and loved, Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, was not a concept or a theological idea to be considered, but a person to be adored and defended. This helps to explain her indignation when she read a pastoral letter on the Eucharist by Cardinal Roger Mahoney of Los Angeles. She found the content of the letter to be confusing and vexing. She casually referenced this letter at the end of her live show, sitting right here one night, I'll and accidentally to. crossed a canonical one. line. When the average layperson, long forgotten whatever catechism they learn, are told that there's no need for confession, there's no need for baptism, there, there's not really a body and blood, soul, and divinity. In fact, the Cardinal of, of California is teaching that it's bread and wine before the Eucharist and after the Eucharist. Uh, I'm afraid my obedience in that diocese would be absolutely mm -hmm. zero. <laughs> and I hope everybody else is in that diocese is zero. Cardinal Mahoney took offense at those comments and demanded that Mother apologize and clarify her statement. Mother gave it to him. So I do want to apologize to the Cardinal for my remark, which I'm sure seems excessive. But he has asked me for clarification. And this is what I would like to do this evening. This is my opinion, and this is how I saw it when I read it. What came through to me was the principal focus in this letter of assembly, the concentration on assembly, all the people in the church rather than the Eucharist. So I felt the letter was unclear to what the church teaches about the real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. At one point, she raised questions about Cardinal Mahoney's assertion that Jesus' presence was in the simple gifts of bread and wine. Watch this. I'm a simple woman. And I don't understand this, you see. So does that mean Christ is present before the consecration in the bread and wine? Is that what it means? Or does it mean that he is present after the consecration? Well, if he's present after the consecration, in what way? Did he just kind of hop into the bread and wine, but it's still bread and wine? Or has it become his body and blood? Well, if it's still bread and wine, why would I adore him? Why would I kneel and prostrate myself between what to, to bread and wine? Uh, Father Rutlum, how seismic was Mother Angelica's critique of Cardinal Mahoney's pastoral on the Eucharist? In it, he said that the presence of Jesus was in the simple gifts of bread and wine. Well, uh, the Holy Spirit was speaking mm, through her. We have to be very careful. Our, our, our Lord gave us bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, but through the history of the church, the bishops have tested many of the saints by mm, being obstacles uh, to their witness. I do think that one of the benefits of her gracious death on Easter, practically the same hour, I think, when the two men were on the Emmaus Road and saw mm -hmm. our Lord, uh, one of the benefits is that, is that might humble clerics, especially prelates, 
uh, to recognize that in some ways, for the best of intentions perhaps, they have been uh, obstacles. When Mother started, and she was almost 60, 58 years yeah. old when she started EWTN, if she, uh, they, a lot of the bishops tried to block that. Mm. The bishops conference tried to set up an alternative uh, network, which was a flop, and I'm estimating that the money that was spent was about $40 million in the initial grant, not only uh, not counting money right here in New York for some kind of uh, TV time, if that had simply been invested since then, we'd have at least half a billion dollars for the good works of the church. Um, so I, I, Mother never wanted to get even with people, because mm -hmm. she knew that if you got even, you never got ahead. Right. And now she's ahead of all of us, and I and like I hope that her through her intercessions, a lot of the bishops who are still alive, many have died, many of those who were obstacles to her have died, but some are, are still alive and some are in retirement in moral disgrace. Mm. And that through, through her uh, 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 intercession, they can examine their conscience and give thanks to God that in a, in a negative way, they helped m mother refine her virtues. Without that sandpaper, uh, uh, she might not have been so mm, polished in the life <laughs> of the virtues. And maybe those who gave her the hardest times will uh, meet her in heaven when, when all will see God face to face without the uh, necessity of television. Cardinal Mahoney pursued Mother and meant to have her pay a price for her continued critique of his pastoral letter. He demanded a Vatican investigation of her community, urged other clergymen to encourage Mother Angelica to publicly apologize to him. Throughout, she refused, standing on principle. During that very tense time, a woman came to pray for Mother Angelica at the monastery here, following her live show one evening. And following that prayer session, Mother's legs were healed. For the first time in decades, Angelica could walk and even dance without crutches or braces. You want to dance? Like well, let's, let's dance. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> She always thought that healing was for the people, she would say. It was a way to build up their faith, Mother believed. It was also a needed shot in the arm during a very dark and trying period in Mother's life. In the year 2000, to protect her network and at the urging of her closest advisors, she resigned from the leadership of EWTN. The fear was that her enemies would use her status as a religious to exert control over the network or damage her community. Though Mother Angelica Live continued, Mother Angelica CEO came to an end. Still, the stress of church politics, the public spat with Mahoney, a Vatican investigation, and age brought on a mini stroke that caused Mother's face to sag and necessitated the wearing of a patch. At 78, Mother Angelica wasn't going to let a patch slow her down, not when there were people in need of her homespun, street-smart brand of hope. This is I'm your surprised. We were together for an hour or so today. We made your Christmas show, right? Right. I right. thought it was great. Oh, it was great. We had a good time. Oh, we had a great time. All kind of treats. Uh, yeah, nice. I was nice uh, absolutely floored at your amount of knowledge. <laughs> wait, wait, well, what's this little, what's that? Oh, I want something in a little while, and I thought I would bump it up a little bit. See what I have to deal with? <laughs> you never had it so good. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> then on Christmas Eve 2001, in her chapel, where she had gone to welcome her beloved, Mother Angelica was felled by a debilitating stroke. It stole her speech and nearly killed her. Over the next 15 years, she would live out her mission and continue it in unexpected ways, largely in silence. Mother was once again the silent contemplative she had vowed to be back in 1947. Mother, she suffered so beautifully all her life, you know, and especially now she just uh, so um, resigned to God's will and united to God's will and so, you know, serene and uh, um, I, 
you just have to really live with her to know uh, how much she's uh, meant to us. When the Lord asks her uh, something, she always say yes. So she is uh, united her suffering to his and unite her will with his. Aside from a very few public appearances, including the release of her biography, Mother was largely confined to her cell and bedridden. On Easter Sunday, March 27, 2016, Mother Angelica escaped to her reward, leaving behind an incredible legacy. Her nuns, her brothers, her shrine, and the countless souls she touched and continues to touch today through broadcast and the written word. There is much more that happened during those 15 long years of silence she endured. I called it her grand silence, and it was. She struggled to create new monasteries and strengthen her order. It is a tale of heroic acceptance of hardship and suffering for the good of others. What a gift it's been for me to not only know her, but to fulfill my promise to tell her full story. And now it's all out there. Her whole life was truly a testament to divine providence. May Mother Mary Angelica rest in peace. Well, that is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now. Many, many times during this past year, Mother has taunted me like Pope Julius after Michelangelo. When's this book going to be done? Is this going to be funny? Get this thing done. Well, Mother, it's finally done for us. Thank you.